again, good afternoon and welcome to all of you. And um, this is the first of six series uh, sessions, uh, remembering Solanus's talks, uh, centering around different aspects of his life. Uh, we really started these monthly series last month with a presentation of a play. It was called Solanus. And um, that was done by a group of people, players from Wisconsin, from around his hometown. And uh, they were very delighted. As I said, this is the third time that they've been here in Detroit. And uh, it's been going on for about 15 years. And again, within the next couple years, we hope to have them back again, because they always enjoy coming here and, and visiting the place where Solanus had lived and uh, knew so many of the people. And so, um, with that, of course, then we have uh, today, we have this first of the series of uh, The Family Remembers. And um, of course, this is the first session of the next five will be uh, the uh, events of um, the Capuchins and the Detroit Remembers and remembering Solanus, um, his love for the Eucharist and the love of the Blessed Mother, as well as Solanus's love for the poor and the sick. So we hope to be able to capture all of these uh, various aspects of the life of Solanus and present them to you. And uh, it just helps for us to be able to uh, really appreciate the man all the more and his great love and concern for all. And so uh, with that, I believe then we will begin with uh, Sister Anne Herkenrath and uh, Dr. James Casey. And Conley, excuse me, Conley. <laughs> Starts with a C. <laughs> so anyways, no, and we appreciate their, uh, their presence here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Brother Richard. And this is a delightful group of people. My goodness, I, I never expected this kind of a crowd. <laughs> you know, I thought we'd be talking to, you know, couple dozen people. <laughs> Actually, it's a bit exciting for us to be here to uh, talk to you about the Casey family and specifically Father Solanus. Well, it, it's, th this has been a wonderful time for us to dig in and get back, get some information that maybe we didn't have, checking with other people in the family to, uh, to prepare for this, this uh, presentation. So it's, it's just been great. I had met Father Solanus two times, and both of them were very memorable. So we, but uh, we've been asked to talk about the family life, and growing up in Seattle, where most of the family were living at one time when they left Wisconsin, uh, I got to know my great aunts and uncles and a lot of cousins. And, you know, so family was, family's just been important. In fact, when I was four years old, my family moved in with my grandparents. That was during the Depression years, and, and uh, we moved in with Grandma and Grandpa. Um, every Sunday was a family, a, a, a mini family reunion. Uh, my grandmother would make a pot roast, and um, people came for dinner. Uncle Pat, Uncle Gus and Aunt May, uh, sometimes uh, uh, Aunt Genevieve and Uncle Pat. And, uh, if they didn't come for dinner, they usually came afterwards just to, just to visit. So it was a, a, a reunion every week. So family was important. Um, following dinner, there was the usual game of pinochle. My grandfather and Uncle Pat and, and whoever else was around, uh, they, there was always a game of pinochle. Uh, it was a lively time. Uh, I think that some of the Casey's are a bit competitive, and <laughs> <laughs> so it was lively. Um, Still living at home at that time were the two youngest members of my mother's family, uh, my Uncle Jimmy and Aunt Bunny, 
who they were both going to Seattle College. Now, some of you may remember Sister Bernadine Casey, who worked here with the, uh, Brother Leo and Brother Richard uh, and, and edited the book of letters of Father Solanus. So besides the older folks, there were many college people in and out of the house all the time. So it was an exciting place to be for a four or five year old child. So family life on all levels was important. Our grandfather, James, was the second child and the oldest boy in that family of 16. I loved to listen to their stories of their growing up in my grandfather in Wisconsin and, and my grandmother in the Upper Peninsula, Lantz and Berrigan. Um, if you're looking at the main, at that big picture out in the museum, our grandfather is the one on the far left. I knew a little bit about Father Solanus through the occasional letters from him, but there was a, a kind of a mystique about him that I didn't really understand. Rumors had reached us from time to time of his growing reputation for holiness and the power of his prayer. His brother, Father Ed, made a point of telling us, at least the ones in the West, not to discuss the remarkable things that uh, was going on with Father Solanus. So we didn't discuss them. I believe that Father Ed was afraid that the family would somehow get in the way and begin to promote Solanus or interfere with God's plans for him. That caution was imprinted on our minds so deeply that we just didn't talk about him. That it, this whole thing was between God, Solanus, and the Capuchins. This, of course, made me a little more curious. <laughs> Later in 1945, when our, our cousin John McCluskey, the son of Genevieve, the 16th child of the Casey family, was in Seattle to say his first mass as a Jesuit priest. All the aunts and uncles and cousins gathered for this occasion. I was almost 15. And my family lived on Lake Washington. So we hosted a family picnic after this mass and uh, with uh, Father John. Um, so we had all the living siblings, including the three priest uncles, uh, Father Morris, Father Solanus, and Father Ed. Well, I was pretty curious to meet this Uncle Barney. Father Solanus, because of the stories I had heard of healings and amazing events that I wasn't sure, you know, how should I act? Um, what should I do? But I needn't have been afraid. Father Solanus came over from Seattle uh, on a boat, of, of my cousin's boat. And he jumped off that boat and literally ran up the dock to greet everyone. What struck me, that he was so normal. <laughs> he was fun to be around. He even played ball with the younger people. Later in the day, my dad gathered folks together and began to make some records. We had a little home recording machine that made records on little seven inch discs. And so he, everybody, and th this was my dad, everybody had to come and say their, give their name and say something. Well, when it was Father Solanus's turn, he began by reciting a poem that Father Ed had written years ago called The Old Home. Then he sang Mother McCree and played my dad's old violin. <laughs> Years later, the when the Capuchins asked for mementos of Father Solanus, my mother and I gathered up all these old records and sent them to the monastery. So, so uh, I'm Jim Conley, by the way, again, and, and 
uh, Sister Anne and I are first cousins, right? And our, uh, our, our grandfather was uh, Jim Casey, and that's the oldest brother. Uh, and, uh, and, and that picture on the front of the handout, the picture up there now with this, uh, this poem that was sung. And um, so the, uh, yeah, that picture is from the uh, uh, 50th wedding anniversary of Barney Sr. and Ellen Murphy Casey in uh, uh, 1913. And uh, at, uh, at that, 14 of the, the 16 children who, uh, the, the, who survived, we used to say, around the family dinner table, uh, were, were there. And a lot of them with their, were sons and daughters out in Seattle. It was, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit more about that, including in this, this handout, the, uh, uh, the brothers and sisters that got together, they, you know, they wrote poems like this poem to... Uh, to, to the parents, their parents. Uh, uh, and we give me a couple of stanzas. The, the, the preface to the collection of those poems, it's, uh, the, the collection, by the way, is in the archives here. Uh, and uh, they started trying to publish it back in 1913. They were still working at getting together and getting copyrighted in 1958 when uh, then Monsignor Edward Casey uh, uh, inherited the materials. Uh, when he died in 1961, I... Uh, my, my family was living in Chicago. We were the only ones in the kind of the of the clan that was still back in the Midwest. By by then, everyone else had moved out to to Seattle. So my mom inherited this box of Casey stuff, you know, it was called, and uh, and in it was this collection of of poems and remembrances and things. And the preface that uh, Monsignor Edward wrote is is on the first page there. And we're going to refer to that a little bit later. And it, uh, it talks about the three priests saying, con-celebrating mass together at this 50th wedding anniversary. And it also tells about uh, Mother Casey, right? So Monsignor Edward talking about how his mother remembered uh, uh, this uh, diphtheria epidemic of uh, 1878 and the, the loss of the, the two that were there in spirit, right? I mean, uh, but we have, on the back of that uh, uh, preface uh, page, uh, there are a couple of stanzas from this uh, Golden Wedding Festival song. And, uh, and, and you've got the, the whole of it up there, but we thought we'd, uh, we, we'd start sharing some of our, our primary sources with you uh, just looking at this. So uh, uh, it's, it, it, and this was sung by Aunt Genevieve, right? Uh, so, so um, and she was the youngest of the, of the 16 children, right? And uh, she in turn had nine? She had, no, she had. Oh, she had six. She had five. Or five or six. <laughs> we had the, my mom said she had 50, more than 50 first cousins in Seattle when she was uh, growing up, you know? So, and those were all, of course, family. <laughs> With festival gladness we gather today, dear old daddy and mother McCree, and with hearts overflowing with homage to you, sing your golden jubilee. For 50 long years, life's pathway adown in devotion together you've trod with a tear and a smile in your eyes all the while, ever true to the dear old sod. You know, if I could imitate that Irish brogue, I'd try and do it for this, you know. But uh, so I, I'm just jumping to the last stanza. And may the sweet lessons of faith, hope, and love that we learn, parents dear at your knee, be as beacons to guide us to heaven above and as we sail over life's stormy sea. And now in the calmness of life's sunset glow, we are gathered once more at your knee for air in our hearts will burn homage and love for you, Daddy and Mother McCree. <laughs> so uh, we want to tell you, that, of course, behind the family that came to, to America was this great Irish heritage, right? And, uh, and, and Sister Anne has visited Ireland. We have uh, amazing second cousins, right, that are they're living in, uh, right on the border of Northern Ireland and, and the Irish Free Republic. And, uh, and and uh, this family was very much involved in their, their patriotic love for the old sod, right? Uh, so Sister Anne's going to share with you uh, some, uh, uh, some of the material she's found in terms of visiting relatives in, in Ireland. And doing a little genealogy. <laughs> the family was very important. 
uh, to all the members of that big family. So I'd like to go back briefly and take a look at his heritage. Looking at his grandparents, uh, information is a little bit scarce, but we did find that his paternal grandfather, James Casey, was born in Ireland on April 10, 1804. He was married to Ellen McGarriker on June 20th, 1823. And he died at the young age of 38 on March 20th, 1842. We know a little bit more about his maternal grandmother, who was Bridget Shields. She was born on May 7th, 1807. She was married to Michael Timothy Murphy on September 20th, 1827. She died on June, 20, uh, June 2nd, 1880, and is probably buried in Hastings, Minnesota. Michael Murphy died around 1846 or 47. Rumor has it that he may also have been wounded in a skirmish with the Orangemen while protecting a Catholic church and then died later. The same could also be said about James Casey. Both died so young, but both families lived within yards of the border and where skirmishes with the Orangemen were very frequent. So we know more about the Shields family because our Irish cousins, the Duffies, still live in that same area around Dundalk, County Louth. In my visit to Ireland several years ago, I met dozens of people who claimed to be related to Father Solanus. Bernard James Casey, the father of Solanus, was born at Castle Blaney, Carrickmacross, County Monaghan, Ireland, June 19, 1840. But I have to tell you a story. When I visited Castle Blaney, my cousin Linda Duffy and I were just strolling down this little street. Um, we kind of, we just looked in the windows, you know. But something possessed me to turn into this one little shop and we were still talking. And all of a sudden, there was a voice from the back of the room said, you sound like an American. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, what brings you here? And I said, well, my great-grandfather was born here. Oh, what's his name? As if he was like living right next door. <laughs> I said, Bernard Casey. And he pulled his hand out of his pocket and said, related to Father Solanus Casey? And I was astounded, and he was excited that a rel another relative was there. And so he left the two of us in his shop, and he went out next door to where there were two Casey women who had a, a sewing shop. And he was broadcasting that this American was here uh, who was related to Solanus Casey. So you never know who you're going to meet and what they might know. After uh, Solanus's father died, his mother, Ellen Casey, sailed from Liverpool, England with Bernard James and his sister Ellen to join an older brother, Jack, and two sisters who were living in Boston. They arrived in Boston, Massachusetts, on the SS Curling, July 29th, 1857. Elizabeth, Ellen Elizabeth Murphy was born at Camwell, County Armagh, Ireland, on January 9th, 1844. In 1849, when Ellen was about five years old, her widowed mother, Bridget, along with a sister, seven-year-old Mary Ann, and three-year-old Morris, sailed from Liverpool. It took four weeks for the crossing on the, on the uh, SS Western Star, arriving in Boston on June 20th, 1952. In the US, they joined 11-year-old Owen and nine-year-old Patrick, who had come the year before and were staying with Shields relatives in Boston. 
After a few years, at a 4th of July picnic in 1860, Ellen was introduced to Barney Casey by a common cousin. It was apparently love at first sight. Soon, Bernard proposed. In the meantime, Ellen's mother had gone on to Hastings, Minnesota to be with Mary Ann and, and her young family. She had just had twins. When Ellen wrote to her mother about the proposal, she was promptly told, come to Hastings m m immediately. At 16, she was too young to get married. Apparently, Mary Ann was 16 when she got married and then uh, had all of a sudden, you know, twins. So Ellen went. Now, she had a beautiful singing voice, and she joined her mother singing in the parish choir. Another member of the choir was Mrs. Ignatius Donnelly, a good friend of Ellen Murphy. Mr. Donnelly's work caused him to be away from home much of the time, and Mrs. Donnelly was lonely. And so she begged Ellen Murphy to uh, allow uh, young Ellen to, to, uh, to uh, move in with her. This was granted, and in time, Ellen became like a daughter to the Donnellys. When Ellen confided her love for Barney Casey, Mrs. Donnelly took it upon herself to persuade Bridget Murphy to allow the marriage to happen. She then invited Ellen to accompany her husband and herself on a trip to Boston, where Ellen and Barney would marry on October 6th, 1863, in Salem, a Boston suburb. Now, some of our records say in Salem, and others have say in Denver. Uh, I presume those are two places that are fairly close together. At the time they were married, Barney was making shoes for the Union Army. So they lived in Pennsylvania. The first two children, Ellen Bridget and James Michael, were born there in 1864 and 1865. After the war, Bernard set up a shoe shop near Philadelphia. This did not prove to work too well, as Bernard was unable to refuse credit to parents who had children without shoes. As a result, Bernard and Ellen accepted the suggestion of Ellen's brothers, Owen and Pat, to take their little family and go to Wisconsin, where good land was available on the Mississippi, just below Prescott, in a place called Oak Grove, where four more children were born. Then tragedy struck in November of 1878, when the dreaded diphtheria attacked several of the Casey children. 12-year-old Mary Ann, the number three child, died on November 20th. And a week later, three-year-old Martha died. The others recovered, but it is said that Barney Jr., Jr. the future Father Solanus, had a wispy voice from that time on. At this uh, 50th wedding <laughs> anniversary, uh, that produced this uh, collection of poems and writings. We have an account of the, uh, the uh, concelebration of the Mass, and we also have an account of the, uh, the death of uh, Mary Ann and, and, and Margaret. And uh, they're really, really moving, and it's, uh, it certainly suggests just what it means when we say family remembers in, you know, among these, uh, uh, especially this generation from the you know, late 19th century and early 20th century. So this is in the handout again. It's, uh, again, uh, this is Monsignor Edward writing in 1958 a preface to this book. And, uh, and he tells us that uh, he is sharing with anybody who reads it what his mother had told to him, what she felt and experienced when she lost these two children. You know? uh, so the wedding was in 1913, right? I'll start at the top of the page here. It was in uh, October uh, 6, 1913 in Seattle, Washington that uh, 
the Casey couple celebrated their golden, golden wedding. Three of their sons were on the altar as celebrant, deacon, and subdeacon to celebrate the solemn mass and receive the renewal of their parents' wedding vows. Father Morris Casey, missionary priest among the Indians in Montana, was celebrant of the mass. Father Solanus, OFM Cap, Capuchin priest stationed in New York City, Sacred Heart Parish in Yonkers, was the deacon and preached the, uh, the sermon. And uh, Father Edward Francis Casey acted as subdeacon. Now, um, Father Ed says that uh, four of the daughters had been already mentioned in parts I left out of this preface, but um, he says the two whose visible presence we missed were undoubtedly present at the golden wedding, but looking on with the church triumphant. In December of 1878, there had been, they had been carried off in an epidemic of diphtheria which swept through Wisconsin before modern science had discovered the repertory of uh, remedies now at its command. All of the Casey children were attacked by the deadly virus, seven of them at one time, but home remedies and rugged health triumphed in all except Marianne, age 12, and little Martha at three. A sweet little ray of light is thrown on the lives of the two children by their mother's recollection. So that seemed important to us, to, especially to share with you. She was softly bemoaning the death of Mary, who had been particularly careful in keeping the floors of the two-room log cabin of their home free from dirt. They had purchased from people who had gone out to the Mississippi Valley in, uh, uh, in, 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 at the time of the Homestead Act. And, uh, and, and so they were living in this first home along, the, and I think this is what they called Oak Grove, right? Uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, so uh, this, uh, with a family of seven boys and three girls, all under 15 years, Mother Casey found this one of her minor problems. Ellen was already preparing to obtain a teacher's certificate she hoped thus to lighten the load of her father's sho uh, shoulders, for as yet he was the only breadwinner. So 12-year-old Mary, in her eagerness to help with the home housework, had concentrated her energies against dust and muddied floors. And now that the neat Mary was in her coffin, her mother was thinking with some misgivings of the amount of dirt and mud that seven little boys and their fathers were constantly bringing in from the fields, gardens, and paths surrounding the house. Ah, careful Mary, she sighed to herself. There'll be no one now like you to help me sweep the floors. And then as her rosary beads continued to slip through her fingers, she pres presently found three-year-old Maddie on her lap and a little arm around her neck. Don't cry, Mama. I'll sweep the floors. Just one week later, Maddie was placed in her coffin. The dreaded white blotches in the throat had conquered both little girls. The grief of the parents over the death of the two children in quick succession was softened by their Catholic faith. They knew that Martha was among the holy innocents. And as for Mary was preparing for her first communion, when death came, they had no misgivings about her salvation. Now, just as a note on that, of course, Father Solanus was born in 1870, right? So in 1878, he's eight years old, and this is the... Uh, this is his, uh, uh, Marianne is slightly a couple years older than he is, and, uh, and, and Martha's, you know, the, the little one in their family. Morris was 11 at the time, and uh, Monsignor Edward, who's writing this, telling us it's, it's what his mother told him about the experience, right? You know, wasn't, uh, wasn't yet born, right? But it, so the family remembers, right? And to know Father Solanus is... Uh, in part to know how much, what a bonding experience that must have been. Certainly around the table with us, it was always, you know, uh, your Uncle Barney or your Uncle uh, Gus or uh, uh, the, the, uh, of the family of 16, 14 who survived. Those two were always alive and a part of their family and it's part of our, of course, Christian faith and this is a family that loved their faith, right? They loved, uh, uh, they loved learning too. They loved to, to tell stories. <laughs> And that's part of what we can, we can share with you. Um, I, I, I think one of the stories that we were going to share with you is, uh, as part of this love of learning was uh, 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 
Grandpa Barney's uh, uh, interest in books, right? So his farmers, and uh, of course, having survived the potato famine, right? In, in Ireland, the, uh, being farmers was, was of primary importance. So you could put real food on the table and not watch, uh, you know, in Ireland, I think over a million people died in, the, in, in, in that potato famine in the 1850s. And, uh, uh, and so they, they remembered that. But, but Barney was, he loved, uh, he, he was going to make sure his children were educated and Ellen was becoming a, a school teacher. And, um, and uh, for both Barney and, and, and Ellen, education was very important. The, the children all went to school. Young Ellen, uh, Nell, as they called her, uh, was preparing to teach. And Bernard Sr. would promote education by ordering uh, books and magazines, especially Catholic ones, from St. Paul that he would later sell to the neighbors. Uh, uh, all the Casey children read from their books, these books. Uh, so they, he went up to St. Paul and would pick up and bring back home a big sack of books. Uh, the train ran through their property, and uh, so as it was running past the Casey farm, he would toss out this satchel of new books, and you know, a couple of the Casey boys would run out and pick up the satchel and bring them home, and, and, and they learned to read, and they read those books, and that was part of their entertainment at home, and when they got to write, they were writing poems and stories and telling stories and, and doing their homework, I'm sure. <laughs> you know? uh, so as the train passed by, the Casey's would, Casey boys would go out into the field and would be there to, to fetch the books. Right? Um, education, of course, was important. Religion was their priority importance, I think. You know, they, were, they just loved their faith, and it meant so much. And it certainly helped them through things like the loss of, of Mary Ann. And uh, Sister Ann, there's, uh, uh, we've got a great story about, uh, I, and it comes up. It's in uh, Father Crosby's book. Uh, uh, thank God ahead of time and some other places, but it's it's really worth retelling here with you. Right? So education and religion were the two outstanding fruits of this growing family. But getting to church on Sunday was a matter of logistics because they had only one wagon. So they took turns. On one Sunday, half of them would go to church and the next Sunday, the other half. But for those that stayed home, they had their own church service. The prayers were read, the readings discussed, and when the church group got home, the sermon was discussed. So all would benefit, and as a result, each of those children learned how to really listen and then to to give it back to others. Um, to, they learn to express their faith. And as a family, they all participated, even the toddlers, in the evening prayers and the rosary. And mother, the mother usually led the, uh, led the, the, the evening prayers. School was another matter of importance. The older boys went to school as much as they could. Our grandfather, being the oldest, had the least formal education, as he was needed to work the farm with his father. The same was pretty true with the first four or five boys. The younger children had much more opportunity for school, and they excelled. Even though the older ones didn't get as much formal schooling while on the farm, they read everything they could find, recited poetry, and, and held debates among themselves and their neighbors. They had a thirst for learning. From this family of 14 adults, the Casey family produced three priests, two lawyers, two businessmen, and at least five teachers. But life was not tedious in all study. The teenage Casey's were a lively group and loved singing and dancing, with barn dances as being their favorite. Their home was a place all the neighbors loved to visit. It was always lively and fun, 
and it was always open house. On one occasion, a friend left a violin, and Barney began to teach himself to play. Even though his playing never became very proficient, he improved enough to be called upon to play at the barn dances. Then we're going to skip a few years. Um, Barney was instrumental in, in, in trying to bring home uh, additional money for the family, and he had very various and sundry jobs. Uh, in uh, Stillwater, and, and then finally in Superior as a um, streetcar driver. And so he writes to his family to come, sell the farm, and come to Superior. So Superior had a promising future as a boom town. So Barney persuaded his family to sell the farm and come to Superior. This proved to be a wonderful decision for there were good jobs to be had, and the opportunities for higher education was within reach of all. After an accident on the streetcar tracks, that really shook Barney up a bit, quite a bit. Barney talked with his pastor, who encouraged him to go to the diocesan seminary of St. Francis de Sales in Milwaukee, also known as the German Seminary, because most of the classes were taught in German. You know, this Irish lad, didn't, you know, he, he had an eighth grade education, all right, but to learn German? <laughs> this, uh, this pastor also warned him that now at age 21, he would be entering at a high school level at, with young men much younger than himself, like about seven years younger. Barney tried very hard, but found the studies difficult because of the German language. Finally, his seminary superiors advised him that he better go home, but to consider going to a religious community so he went home discouraged. All that summer, he prayed to discover what God wanted of him. His priest friend and spiritual director suggested he write to the provincial superiors of the Jesuits, the Franciscans, and the Capuchins. All three said they would take him. With the Feast of the Immaculate Conception approaching, he asked his mother and big sister Nell to join him in making a novena to Our Lady, asking for her help. On the day of the, of the feast, December 8th, after receiving Holy Communion, he distinctly heard Our Lady tell him, go to Detroit. This meant the Capuchins. Even though it was close to Christmas and his family wanted him to, to stay for the holidays, he made plans to leave immediately. So on December 21st, in the midst of a heavy snowstorm, he left home, arriving at St. Bonaventure Monastery on Christmas Eve, and his life as a Capuchin began. So uh, th this is a, a picture that we have of the, the family in Superior. They built a home there. They were, uh, you know, from starting out in a two or three room uh, log cabin to a farm with five barns and outbuildings and a home on it to uh, to moving to the city and building their own house. And I think uh, our our grandfather Jim, uh, I think they had a farm too, uh, Sister Anne, outside of Superior, right? That uh, I think they might have had a dairy farm or something dairy like farm that. There, so, uh, but. Uh, uh, Barney Senior was a was a sheriff of uh, of Superior. He's got his badge on there, and uh, there's uh, there's Ellen, mother of sixteen, fourteen, who survived. Right, they're the the three girls that were the the last three that were born. Uh, this is our grandfather Jim. That's his uh, older sister Ellen, that was the 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 teacher. And um, 
And that's Father Solanus sitting down next to him there, right? So this is uh, before he, uh, and, and that's a picture that's blown up and you can see in the museum there. It's uh, uh, before he entered the, uh, uh, the seminary. As we mentioned in, uh, that uh, uh, in this group that celebrated in 1913 uh, their, their uh, 50th wedding anniversary, uh, that uh, there were three priests. This is a picture of the three priests. Father Morris is on your left and uh, uh, who was involved in the missions in, in Montana and uh, uh, eventually joined the uh, Capuchins, I guess, in some uh, manner. And, uh, and, uh, and next to him, of course, is Father Solanus. And then there's, uh, uh, here it's Father Edward. He eventually went to the Philippines in 1934 and served their founded schools out in uh, the Philippines was uh, uh, impounded, I guess, in, uh, when the Japanese in invaded the Philippines, and he uh, uh, was virtually starving to death in 1945 when uh, they were liber liberated when the Americans came to the back to the Philippines. Um, so he had uh, he had plenty of stories to tell and much to remember. We do have a copy of his journal from uh, from those last days in uh, Batanzas Prison. Uh, 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 south of Manila, um, the uh, uh, Monsignor Edward was w was a poet. He uh, started writing short stories and poetry when he was in college as a seminarian at St. Thomas College uh, in St. Paul. He uh, uh, he he wrote one poem to uh, a, a really significant poem. And again, uh, it's it's one that's referred to. It's it's entitled the. Uh, Brother Sacristan, it's also in your handout. Uh, it, it's on the back of the page that had the preface uh, about the children dying. And uh, give me a couple of the stanzas from it. So, uh, and again, this was one of the poems that was in this collection of, of memoirs and, and writings from the 50th anniversary. Uh, it, 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 it's a significant one because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, Father Solanus was ordained as simplex priest, right? So he didn't have the faculties for uh, hearing confessions and for uh, preaching publicly. I think that's that's the the way that that works. And uh, uh, I know Father Crosby, Mike Crosby, uh, uh, claimed he was the, the only one that ever had that, and he thought it was it might have had something to do with the, his being Irish and this, you know, this uh, German Wisconsin part of the, the country. Uh, in any case, uh, 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 Monsignor Edward, there's a brother sacristan, Monsignor Edward wrote, or Father Edward at the time, uh, wrote this, uh, this, this poem to, to Father Solanus, and we have Father Solanus's comment on it, the, the bottom of this poem in the, in the text we have, it's in you know, Father Solanus's writing, and, uh, and, and show, we'll show you with that com uh, comment too. So this is the way that Brother Sacristan goes. He's encouraging his brother. He also calls out the, how important it is to, to be humble and you know in the, in the cause and advancement of the, of the process, right? They, uh, for that first stage, they had to declare a, a heroic virtue and the heroic virtue, you know, among all these uh, Irish people with kind of big egos, I think, and sometimes, you know, that uh, he, was, he was recognized for his virtue of heroic uh, humility, right? So, um, the brother sacristan, it says. The God of mercy, meek and humble, holds his reign of peace in tabernacled cell. I was talking, thinking of Father Solanus as the sacristan and taking care of the linen and the, making sure that the uh, altar is always worthy of our Lord. While spotless order quietly enfolds the place where man's redeemer comes to dwell. With reverent love, a modest figure kneels to pay the voiceless homage of his heart. Then silently from place to place, he steals the worship of his fingers to impart. Each object there receives his tender touch, the snowy linen flowers burnish a bell with, while conscience whispers sweetly, it is such for his dear sake to do each duty well. Dear Lord, he whispers, dearest crucified, touch my heart, my poor heart in penance to repair in some degree the luxury, the pride, the gold, neglect that leaves you lonely there. 
He lingers still and fain would there abide where evening shadows fill the chapel dim. At last he goes but leaves his heart beside the faithful little lamp he loves to trim. So uh, now what's one of the things that's interesting about this particular poem, one it's from one priest to a brother priest, you know, and it's about this uh, situation of being a simplex priest in an age when you know everybody went to confession once a week and, and uh, you know that uh, uh, wasn't allowed to preach publicly. Uh, he did give these uh, favorinos, I think they were called, right? At the time when the, the Capuchins had this tradition of, of, of bringing out relics and uh, healing ceremonies. Uh, we have this note from Father Solanus about the, you know, the, the poem, Brother Sacristan. He says, the poet's ideal sacristan that's described here, being so careful and humble, uh, should hardly discourage any of us in case we find ourselves wanting an appreciation for the privilege of services so exalted in the sight of heaven as the everyday sacristan. On the contrary, it should rather stimulate our determination in all humility to foster faith in God, which alone inspires divine hope and appreciation for supernatural ideals. So uh, clearly the focus of our presentation of family remembers is Father Solanus, you know, and, and you can catch so much of his spirit in this kind of dialogue with uh, his, his brother, Father, Father Ed. Uh, Father Morris also received a, a, a poem, Father Morris's poem, I think is this one called Ten Years of Priest. Father Morris was uh, ordained. He had gone to the seminary in Milwaukee, had come home. Uh, uh, that not working out, he eventually, I think, went to, uh, uh, um, and, and, and was ordained in uh, June of 1911. And, Ten years later, Father Red wrote a poem to him saying, hey, you know, we've been priests together. We even got to kind of celebrate with each other for our, the wedding of our, our parents, you know, like, we'll keep them with you. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is on the, uh, the third page there, right? Uh, uh, ten years a priest. Ten years a priest, dear reverend brother, hail ten years of service in the glorious cause of God to make his holy will prevail among the weak who violate his laws. For 20 years, a rover long you strayed a lonely exile from the Levites class, now hoping, now despairing, while you prayed that someday you might say a single mass. There was a brilliant morning, bright with June, three brothers at an altar, an array of God's love sweeter than the sunlit noon Caress the priestly robes you wore that day. It was a gray October morning when our parents came with reverent step and slow to pledge in golden vows their truth again. You sang the mass. Your blessing bade them go. Toil on, dear Father Nor Morris, many years God's bountiful increase be always given. So one priest would certainly encourage the other, inspire the other, and uh, as we say, this is, uh, Father Solanus was such a, a, a special person, right, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, the context for that was this uh, family of 16, 14 who survived, and um, the last of the stories, uh, we, we, uh, Sister Ann mentioned this poem, old, uh, The Old Home, uh, and, uh, and we want to finish with, with, with that, and we're kind of moving towards our, our, our closing remarks with you, but, uh, and, and then we'll ask if there are any, any questions that some of this might have brought into your minds, you know. And, uh, I, I have to tell you, uh, both of us, when, when we saw that this was scheduled from 12 to 3, you know, we're a little, uh, a little unnerved, right? So, so we've, been, we've been kind of careful not to go off script, you know, and, uh, uh, but, but our storytelling kind of uh, skills, such as they are, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they work a little better when they're just, you know, on, not on script and kind of reading to you. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, uh, Monsignor Edward, when he was a, uh, 
when he was a seminarian at this uh, St. Thomas College in St. Paul. Um, he, uh, he was one of the editors of their, their literar literary arts uh, magazine. And in the, the version for 1905, he graduated in 1906 uh, uh, with his uh, uh, degree from St. Thomas College. In, in, in 1905, uh, attending St. Thomas as a, uh, as, as, as a seminarian, he, uh, he wrote this and published this short story. And, uh, and, and it recalls this uh, near uh, drowning that he had had uh, back when he was growing up there along the Mississippi River. And uh, I, I, I pulled out three passages from the, uh, from the, uh, the, the short story to kind of uh, share with you. He starts it off and uh, he imagines himself being um, Uncle Ned in this big family. And, uh, you know, the younger ones or maybe the next generation like we would maybe have fallen into. We both, of course, knew both Father Ed and, and, and Father Talanis. Uh, well, in, in Chicago, whenever anybody came from the West Coast, we would, uh, uh, we would meet them at the train or the airplanes and, uh, and often drive out to Huntington. And, uh, and so that, that picture that sort of come around a couple times of, uh, that was 1948, wasn't it, Nancy? Uh, and, uh, and, and Father Solanus, let's see if we can find that. I don't want to stop and, and, and lose track here, but uh, that, uh, that one over there, right? That uh, over on the right-hand side with, uh, that's Nancy, uh, or Sister Ann. Uh, Nancy then, right? <laughs> one of the same person. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And of course, Father Solanus were in front of the Huntington uh, Monastery, there are the, the stairway that went up to the entrance to the monastery. And that's my brother, Dean. I guess he's six, and I'm three years old there in that, that picture and that, that kind of... And I had just finished high school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wicked Irish visions that we were, you know. Um, so... Uh, so A Brave Rescue is the title of this uh, poem. And Uncle Ned is sitting there. It's a stormy night in December. And he, uh, the children have come up to him and they've said, uh, tell us a story, Uncle Ned. You know? and, uh, and so he decides to, that's my demon again. <laughs> uh, guardian, please don't. Oh, all right, thank you. I, you know, actually, one of the reasons, I had two reasons for sort of balancing this. One is to make sure everybody had a copy, and we hope you all take this home and, and you know, let it help you remember this lecture uh, roundtable topic. And, but I, I also want to, I want to show you the, my, the, the version that I'm working with from this uh, 1913 uh, you know, man, typescript of the, of, uh, this is the Brother Sacristan poem. You know? And at the bottom is this uh, typed up note uh, on the version I have of uh, Father Solanus's uh, uh, commentary. So, uh, a brave rescue. One summer evening, says Uncle Ned. Right, uh, uh, there were these storms, and uh, and and uh, the setting here is uh, uh, the school where they all went to the local one-room schoolhouse that Ellen was the school teacher of, their older sister. One school uh, summer evening, a score of light-hearted boys and girls carrying books, slates, and dinner pails were. Uh, it was. It wasn't bag lunches back in the, you know, <laughs> 18, the uh, just then a neighbor of ours driving by paused when he saw my sister who taught the school standing on the steps well teacher he began taking a pipe from his mouth I suppose you heard of the boy to get drowned this morning in Boardman no indeed said Ellen who was at Mr. Deal as she approached the wagon the children gathered eagerly around it was one of Dick Whalen's boys a young feller 12 years old about the size of that lad there pointing with his pipe to my brother Patrick, the latter stood a Robinson's arithmetic and a, a, a Patterson speller in one hand and a dinner pail in the other. And when noticed, he gazed at the, grown, uh, at the ground and began to kick industri industriously at a root that straggled beside the road. Well, uh, he, uh, uh, Patrick and Ned come back to this uh, river that they had to cross to get home. And, and it had a 30-foot log bridge that they had to uh, scramble across. And the, 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 that went out to a, a rock outcropping in the middle of the river and then a, another 20-foot bridge over to the other side. And uh, uh, 
Ned is the first to start the cross, and Patrick is encouraging him, and uh, they get out to the rock outcrossing, and Patrick said, no, come on, you're halfway there, and we're almost finished. And Ned says that he got halfway across that second part of the bridge, and he looked down, and he saw this rushing stream, and he thought about the, the boy who'd fallen in, and he loses his footing, and of course he falls into the, the river, right, you know. And he's tumbling and turning around in the in the stream, and he and he surfaces, and and he sees his brother Patrick up on 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 the bridge, looking to see where he is. And so uh, suddenly, this is uh, Ned narrating this, right? Years later, I don't know how my head was raised to the surface for an instant as it happened. My face was turned upstream, and there, to my surprise, was the bridge, scarcely thirty feet away, at the very spot where I had fallen. Patrick was standing. And tonight I can close my eyes and see home still as clear as at that instant. For when I felt the sweet air once more and opened my eyes, I thought it was for the last time on earth and the scene before me was stamped forever on my childish heart. He was standing alert in the attitude of one about to spring and was watching the river intently. And when I saw his face, I knew that he had resolved to risk his life. His boyish jaw was set, his nostrils were dilated, and in his brave blue eyes there was a light that showed a dauntless soul wakened to all its strength in the presence of supreme danger. He caught sight of me the instant I rose, and just as those roaring waters dragged me down again, I saw him hurl himself with all his strength straight toward me. And so the next thing he remembers is his brother holding him up and telling him to help to paddle with his hands. And... Uh, I did so awkwardly, but with all my might, in another moment he touched bottom, seized me with both his hands, swung me shoreward, while a fervent, thank God, burst from his lips. Well, uh, they get home, uh, they do their homework, you know, they, they, they don't make a big deal out of this, this accident, you know. And uh, in fact, you'll see in this uh, closing paragraphs of this story, uh, you know, Mama, uh, Mother Casey just, kind of laughed it off, you know. But the memory that uh, Father Ed has of this, of his family, as he remembered what that being a part of family meant, right, was in these last paragraphs. Um, Mother laughed at my accident that evening and jested merrily about it until I myself was able to laugh. But an hour after I had gone to bed, a nervous dream startled me from sleep, and in the dim light of the moon, I could discern the form of my mother kneeling silently beside me. A teardrop fell upon my hand. After a long pause, Uncle Ned added, Boys, I've traveled some since that night and have met and loved and trusted many friends, but when such had proved false, when fondest hopes have been shattered, or the world has seemed a miserable place, in such times, my memory has always turned for renewed faith and comfort to that image of my mother kneeling like an angel guardian in the dim moonlight beside my bed. Well, that's what we remember when we say Venerable Solanus Casey, the family, remembers. Uh, that time that Sister Anne met Father Solanus running up the, the, the dock at their Waterside home and on Lake Washington, and recording his uh, his his favorite poems. He chose this uh, this poem, the um, the old home, and I think uh, Sister Anne, the uh, uh, this I I have to get back to that. Uh, my copy of the old poem is there. I'm gonna, there's another slide where, uh, but I, at some point you learn that poem, right? And so we thought we'd kind of bring closure to this uh, uh, with. Sister Anne's uh, reading this. I really have liked this poem. I've loved this poem because to me, I get so many vivid images of, um, of that family life and, and, and how, they, how they lived and how, the fun that they had and the struggles that they had as well. So, when we were young, the world was hung with beauty everywhere. We loved our home. We loved to roam mid woods and fields so fair. We tramped around St. Helen's Mound or herded cattle there. 
At night we'd lark till through the dark Dad's grand old voice called, Prayer, prayer boys. Then Mother led the prayers, we said, though each in turn took part. And sweet became love's holy flame before the sacred heart. Dear Mother's face, with heaven's grace aglow, her modest eyes upraised or closed, in peace reposed, her heart in paradise. And Father, too, so staunch and true, quick to defend the right, yet meek and mild as humblest child when we knelt down at night. To school we went, right well content to learn the world of, of letters. And as we learned, our spirits burned away the dullard's fetters. We learned each rule in that old school, then out to play and run. Sometimes we fought, but soon forgot our fury and our fun. We learned from brooks and hills and brooks and all the growing earth. While limbs grew strong, life all a song of innocence and mirth. Each step, each look our teachers took was molding minds and hearts and shaping souls for varied roles in life's dramatic parts. And all the time, each tale, each rhyme, each story we'd explore was planting seeds of biting deeds that grow forevermore. They're with us still. They form our soul's deep sod to feed the self with pride or pelf or bind us close to God. So, Sister Anne, yes, <laughs> we're just about at, <laughs> at our wrapping up, but I'm sure we didn't want to leave without reminding you that a close friend, a member of our family, was, of course, Brother Leo and Brother Richard, too. And, uh, and so we certainly recall call them as we're uh, doing this. Uh, and I, I might interrupt here and say that, that Brother Richard is a shirt tail relation to the uh, Casey's. Aunt Nell, the oldest girl in that family, married a Tom Trainer. Well, Tom Trainer had a brother who turned out to be Brother Richard's grandfather. So, <laughs> so uh, and, and you know, it's all a treasure, isn't it? It's just amazing. So, um, we, we do have, I guess, a couple of conclusions. Father Dan early on, well, for the, Father Dan's still over, right? And uh, he, he said, you know, to, to know a person, uh, part of it is to know their, their family background, right? Behind everybody is a, is a family. And so to really to better uh, appreciate and, 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 and be inspired by Father Solanus. And, and part of it is, is to know that, that blood kin relationship of sorts, you know? Um, like all families, and, and that certainly is a conclusion that we would come to from all of this, right? Like all families, the, uh, the Casey's uh, uh, had some really painful setbacks. Can you imagine losing, a, you know, a 12-year-old daughter and a, a three-year-old little girl? And then they also had struggles with the farming. Yeah. You know, the, the one year maybe it was more than one year, the, the, the wheat crop got a, some kind of a blight and was just wiped out. And uh, so there, there were hard times. It wasn't just all fun and games. But they worked together, they prayed together, and the family still stays together. So I think with this, I think we can say thank you to Everybody here is at the monastery. Thank you to Father Dan, to Brother Richard, who um, suggested this. I guess it was Father Dan that suggested it and then uh, gave it to Brother Richard to, to put into practice. <laughs> so we're grateful. But I would just encourage you, if you haven't done this already, I would encourage you to look in your own family histories. You know, 
write it down. Tell the stories to your kids and your grandkids. Pass on that beauty of, of family. Even some of the things that weren't so good. So with that, we thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Sister Anne. <laughs> And on behalf of everyone here and the Capuchins, we want to thank the both of you, uh, Sister Ann and uh, Dr. Jim, for your presentation here and helping us to learn more about the life of uh, Solanus Casey and his family. And as you say, kind of the, the things that went on with them and uh, ends up being a saint. So I guess we can all kind of head towards that direction of all being saints at some time. Maybe if there's any questions. What is the status? Um, is he becoming in the process of becoming a saint, or are they? Yeah. Where does that stand? Yeah, the status uh, at this point would be that um, um, he is uh, considered uh, venerable, Solanus Casey, and our next step is to become blessed, and we have to be able to prove or to present uh, a case of healing that the church will accept. And um, there are a couple cases that we are looking at and that we hope that uh, the church will accept them in time. And of course, to put a, say next week that this is going to happen is another story, you know. Um, it, it can't uh, take place that quickly. And um, so with all the other cases that are there uh, in Rome, we have to wait our turn, so. Any other? Questions? Uh, for Sister Anne, how, you said you met Father Salas twice. How old would you have been? I assume you were young, but just do you remember what year? What, what I was about 15 okay. uh, the first time when, when they, we had the uh, mass for our cousin and, and all the, everybody came. Hundreds, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it was big. But all related. <laughs> and then the, the second time, was 1948. I had just finished high school, and that's when that picture. That picture. That picture was taken um, in front of uh, the uh, monastery at Huntington, Indiana, and this little guy was, you know, <laughs> three years old. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe uh, both of you can, can share the recent uh, family event uh, yeah. that you had in Seattle oh, yeah. with the, uh, the uh, Memorial to trust to your great grand father's father's parents. At Calvary Cemetery in Seattle, our great grandparents, Bernard and Ellen, um, are buried along with nine of their children are buried at Calvary Cemetery. And most of them are all in the same area. There's two that, you know, one went with Aunt May's family and, and uh, Owen, I don't know why Owen, Uncle Owen got where he got, but anyway, he, they're there. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, with, with Pope Francis, having us have the year of the family. This was a, a time that we could put into a practice, a, a suggestion that Brother Leo made many years ago when they had, uh, he and Brother Richard were, had come to Seattle. And I took them out to the cemetery to show them, you know, the parents of Solanus and, and all these Casey uh, siblings. And you know, I talked with the cemetery people at, at that time, and they were, they thought this was, was a, a good idea. And, um, but then I didn't do anything more, but finally, a after the Pope declared this year of the family, then we got into it. And uh, with the, the cemetery, uh, actually, uh, one of the members there did the design that we had uh, for this monument there was enough room at the head of, of our, my great-grandparents that they, we could put up a monument. Well, I was thinking of a little monument, and what, what came up was 
it turned out to be a very good size. Uh, so we wanted to dedicate this. And um, so on November 5th of this year, 77 family members came from across the country uh, and from California and all around and came to Seattle for this dedication. And it just happened that that particular day, Seattle had an inch and a half of rain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, <laughs> and so it was uh, uh, pouring. It was pouring. I have, we don't, I don't have, it's not here, but I have uh, some video clips of, um, uh, well, I guess, they, yeah, video clips uh, up at the cemetery that one of our sisters uh, took. And you can hear the rain <laughs> pounding down all these umbrellas, you know. <laughs> but we, I think you have one picture. Well, it's that corner one up there, and I'm, I'm afraid to try to, oh. to en enlarge it. Yeah, well, is that another, another question? I, 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 how could anyone follow that? <laughs> 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 no. Just curious, what is the figure on the... Uh, so the figure on the monument is, is the statue of Father Solanus, okay. right? And, and that's... That's facing the tombs of the of the of the grand great our great grandparents, but the you know the Barney Senior and Ellen uh, Murphy Casey, and then uh, our uh, <coughs> Daddy Jim, right? Mom and, and Aunt Aurelia's Daddy Jim and and uh, Emma are are among those buried with them, so are our own grandparents. So uh, this was special. Uh, of course, you recognize uh, uh, Brother Richard there. And, and uh, Father Larry Weber, uh, and, and uh, Sister Anne, and that's uh, that's Monsignor Ryan is the other uh, priest there. And they put together this this you know really lovely liturgy, and you know each each branch of the family had uh, uh, got a chance to have a member stand up and do a part of the reading. You know, so there's a lot of bonding. It wasn't like bonding like losing two sisters, but it was a real special event. And, uh, Monsignor Ryan, I guess, just completed 50 years, was it? He just celebrated 50 years of ordination. Wow. And yeah. uh, he's still the pastor at the St. James Cathedral. And it's, uh, 1984, was it? He, when, uh, when did you start there? Oh, I started in 82. All right, so, but, so uh, Father, Sister Ann has been the like associate pastor of the Cathedral Parish in Seattle. So I guess I better not use that term, right? I'll be, <laughs> but, you know, this is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Amoris Laetitia, they say, <laughs> you know, the joy of loving your faith and yeah. church. But, but Father Ryan has, is also, uh, he came in 1988, and he's been there ever since. Um, and he's a good friend. And very supportive of the... Uh, and very much so. Solanus Cross. Uh, one, one day on staff, at a staff meeting, uh, he came out with something that just blew me. We had talked for some time of having some kind of a resource center for um, the people on the street, the people getting out of Harborview Hospital uh, or getting out of jail, because we lived right, we're right in that neighborhood. And so we were, we'd been working on that for quite some time. Well, at the staff meeting, you know, Father said, well, it's a reality. We are going to have this resource center and we're going to call it the Solanus Casey Center. And I just jumped out of my chair. I, what? <laughs> and he didn't tell me ahead of time. <laughs> so, other question? Yeah, over here, I guess, please. Um, you mentioned that your um, you'd made a recording, uh, and he and he quotes the poem and stuff. Did they ever make a recording of that recording that we could hear? I think some of that, yes, um, yeah, we had, uh, we, we sent those, re those records here to the monastery, but you know, they're, they're old and fragile and, and uh, uh, pretty scratchy, but uh, they, they did, you, you did uh, reproduce that, some of that, because we've got Father Solanus saying a few words and, uh, and Playing, did you play the violin? Why don't you tell him? Yeah. Um, from what I remember, um, he does, uh, part of it is, uh, he, part of that poem is, 
um, uh, how uh, God made me to know him and to love him and to serve him as sure the same. And then it goes on with some more, but I don't remember it at all, I'm sorry. But anyways, that was, uh, there, are, there are some, we do have them recorded, yes. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, after Vatican declares the sainthood of Father Solanus, will his body remain in the center here? Yes. Soon, we hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If uh, Father Solanus is uh, uh, beatified and then canonized, his body will remain here in church. Yes. And at this point, we're not sure that the body would be exhumed. Most likely, it would remain as is. Not necessarily, no. Yeah. Was once, wasn't it? Yes. They've already done that. They've already exhumed it. Yes, yes, but then they had, yeah, right. I was, I was present for uh, that exhumation. I was one of two family members invited to be present for that. It was uh, an awesome experience, truly. There was difficulty getting the, the uh, casket out of the ground. Uh, they opened, you know, opened up the gravesite, and there was water. Water in the in the vault in the in the, in the surrounding of the, of the casket. And uh, they drilled a hole, didn't they? Well, they they, they used a pickaxe to put a hole in the bottom of the casket. And this is very irreverent, but I'm going to say it anyway. I overheard some Capuchin <laughs> saying, oh, there goes Solanus down the driveway. <laughs> but, but then they, they, uh, they, they brought the, the casket in, opened it, and now he'd been dead for 30 years. And that body was so recognizable. I would have known him any time. He was mostly intact, not completely, but his arms, his forearms and his hands that were very bony to start with uh, were, were reduced to bone. Uh, but besides being recognizable, when the, um, the medical people that, that were there uh, examined him, his, his skin was so soft, and, and you wouldn't think that would be. But they, they, uh, everything in, inside, the lining of the casket, his habit was, was in shreds. So he was clothed with a, a new habit and placed in a new casket and then carried out to its present place. But I was, I, I was very, very blessed to have been there for that. Over here. Um. Yeah, I'm very interested in knowing what material was used to form that statue of Father Solanus. Was it wood or marble or whatever? It is bronze. Bronze, yes. Further back? Yeah, I just have a question. I you could stand up, yeah. Huh. You know, piercing eyes, and I just wondered what your recollection of anything with his eyes. I can tell you one story about his eyes. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I was here in 1948, and, and uh, the Conleys had taken me down to Huntington uh, to see him, I was, I was uh, discerning whether to go to the convent or not. I had another career type very much in mind that I was very interested in. But I also had this tug of war with me that maybe I should go to the convent. So I th said to myself, well, Solanus knows all these things ahead of time. I'll just ask him. 
So I got him by myself, and I told him that I was having this struggle with, do I go to the convent or do I not? And he looked at me, those bright blue eyes twinkling, and he smiled and said, that's between you and God. <laughs> he wasn't going to get into that. <laughs> Uh, I went to college for a year and then I entered. And the name of your order is what? Uh, Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary. And well, we're in, our, our mother house uh, is in uh, Longueuil, uh, Quebec, right near Montreal. And uh, that was our foundation house. And, and our province headquarters are at, at Merrillhurst, Oregon, which is uh, near Portland. And what have you done all these years as a nun? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not you on the no, I, I, uh, I taught elementary school for 11 years, and then I um, moved into high school uh, and taught a variety of things. Uh, but I got a degree in physical education, and so I, <laughs> I've, I did a lot with the girls. I taught at Holy Names Academy, Spokane. It was a girls' school. And so I, I was doing that uh, for several years. Then I was, um, I, I got into well, community service. Uh, and I was uh, superior at a couple of places, including our provincial house. And, and um, uh, that kind of thing. You know, then in 1982, um, I had had a sabbatical, and I, my mother was not doing well, and I wanted to get back to Seattle. <clears throat> and so um, uh, there was an opening at St. James Cathedral. <clears throat> so I went to see, and lo and behold, I'm still there. <laughs> back here? Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you. Uh, I was here Wednesday, and it was someone from the Detroit News that we have been doing one of the brothers about some things about Father Solano. And I just so happened to uh, iterate, once I read in a Detroit, uh, in a paper that he had the biggest funeral oh. in Detroit's history. And also, uh, yeah. the told the article in the paper about this. Father Solano sort of said it right Of course, he, he sat there, yeah. Uh, he died in 1957, right? So, uh, and uh, the July 31st, I guess, that's what we'll celebrate the 60th anniversary of that this, uh, uh, this summer. By the way, both uh, Sister Ann and I are hoping to be here and want to be with all of you and, and celebrate that, uh, that special moment and hope that the cause uh, continues. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a, kind of a famous picture. It's, it, this is one of the sources that we use. This is our... Uh, our Aunt Bonnie, we called her. And on the East Coast, we call her Aunt Bonnie, and out there in the West, they call her Aunt Bunny. But this is uh, Sister Mary and Jean. She was of the Holy Names uh, Order, and uh, and was Sister Bernadine Casey, named after I guess the Bernards, right? And the, including Father Solana. So yeah, in 1957, there's a picture, and there's just throngs of people. I understand something like 30,000 people in the streets outside, 30 or 40,000 people. Maybe I'm way off of that. In all. <laughs> in all, we figured there was probably close to 30,000 people that visited the, oh, okay. the, the monastery here at the time. Mm -hmm. the, for the uh, uh, funeral itself, there was probably a good three or 4,000 people here. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine the church holds 300, 400 people. So <laughs> everybody was outside, basically. So. And of course, for a long while, he was buried right behind the monastery, right? And uh, uh, when we'd come back and visit, my mom would go back there and uh, pick little pieces of grass from around the uh, the, the tomb, you know. And, uh, and of course, those uh, th th just that whole kind of sense of awe, I guess, that uh, respect, and probably part of Father Ed's concerns that and and why really growing up like. I never, never heard that Father Sol there was any talk of miracles or anything with Father Solanus. That was just, he was one of Mom's 
14 aunts and uncles, you know, and when he came to visit, uh, visit us in Chicago, he stayed overnight at our house. I, uh, I, I, I got, I think one of the first times I served mass was, uh, was for Father Solanus back in the early 50s, you know, and he, and that, he has that raspy voice, you know. It was, uh, oh, it was wonderful. No, he was, uh, he was just so down to earth and uh, just loved children. Uh, and of course, uh, our family, we'd, he couldn't leave. It's it's hard. The Irish have trouble winding things down, right? You know, in case you've noticed. <laughs> and uh, but he one of the one of the ways to kind of bring closure to things was to uh, uh, to ask Father Solanus to give us his blessing. You know, so before he left the house, we'd always get Father Solanus's blessing. So um, special, yeah. So that funeral was just amazing and uh, certainly memorable and. You're going to hear more about that in later lectures, I'm sure. There's one story about his, his blessing. His sister Margaret, our Aunt Margaret Casey Ledoux, uh, lived down in California. Uh, she and, and Uncle Frank had their golden wedding. And um, uh, all of a sudden, somebody called out the window of, the, of their home because everybody was out in the yard. They, the yard was fixed up for this big picnic for the celebration. And said, everybody be quiet. Father Solanus is on the phone, and he's going to give us his blessing. <laughs> so as the story goes, everybody knelt down <laughs> in the backyard. And uh, uh, I don't know whether they could hear it. But anyway, uh, he gave his blessing to to special blessing to Aunt Margaret and Uncle Frank for their 50 years, and then uh, to everybody that was there. Maybe one or two other questions we could take, maybe one more. Last question. Yeah, please. Father Solano died at St. John Hospital, right? Yes. Do they have a commemorative plaque in his room where he died? Please. Uh, Father Solanus did die at St. John's Hospital. Uh, I guess it was on the third floor. Uh, they don't have the plaque right at the room, but down in the hallway, uh, there is a plaque there uh, honoring Father Solanus as to where he was. Yes. We have a, a picture or two of Father Solanus, too. Maybe about three days before he died, he was in his habit, and he was in the hospital room. And, uh, of course, uh, I think probably all know the story in so far as when uh, he timed the morning that he did die, uh, uh, Monsignor um, Ed was there with him and um, I understand that uh, Father Solanus uh, simply all of a sudden said, um, uh, raised up himself in bed and said uh, something to the fact of, my God am I all, and laid back down and died. I give myself to Jesus Christ as well, my God and my all. So, Richard, uh, just on the part of both of us, right? Uh, or Aunt, Sister Ann, something else, some, another no, thought? Uh, yeah, it's just been so wonderful. It's been such a great experience that, that you know, we keep uh, uh, over and over again saying that formula of uh, thank God ahead of time, and, uh, and we certainly do thank God for this time. Uh, thank God ahead of time for all the other lectures that are coming. Um, I'm wondering if you would mind just leading us in that uh, uh, prayer for beatification. And, uh, and uh, we can all sort of, it's not written on anything, but we can remember it probably. Does someone have a prayer card by chance? Yes, please. How about you leading it? <laughs> Yeah, yes, he, he has it. O oh God, I adore you. I give myself to you. May I be the person you want me to be, and may your will be done in my life today. I thank you for the gifts you gave to Father Solanus. If it is your will, bless us with the beatification of Venerable Solanus, so that others may carry on his love for all the poor and suffering of our world. As we joyfully accept your divine plans, 
I ask you, according to your will, to hear my prayer. Four. I always say, for the elevation of Father Solanus, your position among your angels and saints, <coughs> excuse me, whereby his example can be carried more far and wide, taken up by so many more, carrying on his mission, your mission, <coughs> excuse me, of mercy and love, especially for the poor, and suffering in our world, through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed, Blessed be God, God in all and his designs. All his designs. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>